It's been quite a while since we've discussed dwarf planets, Pluto, Eris, Haumea, and so on. And it looks like in the last few months we had some really interesting discoveries from all of them, potentially helping us understand their origins, what sort of happens at the outskirts of the solar system, and also making a few surprising discoveries in the process, especially when it comes to what's inside of these objects and how they're structured. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's talk about some of these new discoveries, but also I guess let's start with maybe a bit of a history. This all started in 2005. Three now well-known researchers, Chad Trujillo, Mike Brown and David Rabinowitz, accidentally discovered a very unusual object really far away, way, way past Pluto. This was a discovery of Eris, the object that resembled a tiny moving pixel, but was obviously much larger than a typical asteroid. It also had a very unusual orbit, a very eccentric orbit, an orbit that took approximately 560 years, but for most of its lifetime it stayed on the outskirts as far as 97 astronomical units away from the Sun. And though as you can see right here, it's technically even smaller than the Moon, the discovery of similar objects in the following years led to what's known as the Planetary Debate, or the Great Planet Debate that basically resulted in Pluto becoming not a planet. So yeah, it was all Eris's fault. But nevertheless, it was still a really exciting discovery, mostly because it was super unusual and even more massive than Pluto. Though there were obviously quite a lot of unanswered questions. For example, what exactly are these objects? What's inside of them? And though this right here is just a simulation based on some predictive models, a few years after that, New Horizons was able to physically visit Pluto, making a lot of interesting discoveries. This was a much more active object than we ever imagined, and was even geologically active in its own way. It had a lot of cryovolcanism, it potentially even had some kind of a version of a plate tectonic activity. Mostly because a lot of surface here was relatively new. Some of these features are only millions of years old, not billions as expected. But when comparing observations from Pluto to other similar objects, other dwarf planets, even there things seem to be a little bit different, especially based on what we seem to see from the surface. With all of these observations leading back to the question of how do these objects differ from one another and from other planets? They're clearly not the same and they clearly have a lot of physical differences and they might have been even produced in a completely different way. So do we have any answers? And there's at least one recent paper from the original discoverer of Eris, Mike Brown, and his colleague Brian Butler that provides us with some potential answers for most of these unusual objects. Mostly based on observations of how these objects orbit around their moons, which allow the scientists to determine the overall center of mass in order to then figure out what's maybe inside of them and how the mass is distributed as well. Which then also allowed them to discover how most of them seem to have been formed. And that of course includes Pluto and its moons. With another paper around this time, mostly focusing on Eris and basically its mysteries. And some of the first exciting discoveries are from Eris itself. It seems to be somewhat different from Pluto in one major way. It seems to have differentiated into separate layers, kind of similar to a planet. Very likely containing an icy shell and a rocky core but also very likely lacking in a lot of different types of ices or volatiles as they're also known. In other words, unlike Pluto, it seems to have more planetary features, including physical layers inside that potentially interact in a somewhat similar way. So if we go back to calling Pluto a planet, Eris also has to be a planet as well. With all this very likely being a result of an extremely powerful collision billions of years ago. Or basically very similar collision to the one that created Earth and the Moon. Although I guess on a much smaller scale, but I guess much more importantly, this also resulted in the formation of Eris's moon. Its tiny moon Dysnomia that you see right there, that has a diameter of 615 kilometers, is also a somewhat intriguing object, specifically because it's really large. It's about 1% the mass of Eris, but intriguingly has a very similar mass ratio to Earth and the moon. And so here the parallels are very very intriguing except that obviously there is one major difference, or maybe two, the distance to the Sun and of course the overall size. Since it's even smaller than the Moon itself, this is basically like a shrinked version of our planet and its own Moon. With the additional discoveries suggesting that not only is this a rocky core surrounded by ice, this rock also seems to produce radioactive heat, once again very similar to planet Earth, basically making the crust convective. And that implies a lot of things, including maybe 
some kind of an ocean underneath. Maybe life? Okay, too far. We don't really know anything about that just yet. But still, somewhat exciting initial propositions. Although don't forget, this is all based on models for now, not physical observations. All of the seed would then also create a lot of activity on the surface, with lots and lots of ice activity, possibly even more than what we see on Pluto. I mean, here for all we know, Aries might have an active geological cycle that's visible with extremely young surface features. So yeah, can we have a mission to Aries, please? Uh, thank you. Although here it would still be different from Pluto because Pluto doesn't seem to have the same things on the inside, and so its surface acts a little bit different as well. So these are not the same objects in terms of properties. Obviously studying both in more detail would be super exciting, but unfortunately no one is planning any missions to any of these objects. But then we had another exciting discovery from a slightly different object or a slightly different dwarf planet, Orcus and its moon Vanth. Orcus, discovered back in 2004, is sometimes referred to as anti-Pluto because of its orbit. It actually has a very similar orbit to Pluto, but kind of like on the opposite side, or I guess 120 degrees from Pluto. And so its nickname anti-Pluto is somewhat accurate. Although it's much much smaller in size, at just under 1000 kilometers in diameter. But a much more exciting discovery here is I guess what you see right here. Its moon makes it wobble quite a lot, and that implies that the moon is also massive, Turns out that it's approximately 16% the mass of Orcus, and that ratio of 0.16 is even higher than Pluto and Charon, which only have a ratio of 0.12, implying that Vanth and Orcus have the highest mass ratio in the entire solar system, way higher than anything we know, and more importantly presenting a bit of a problem. It's unclear how this formed, with only one potential explanation making sense. Once again an impact, but an impact that leaves behind a relatively intact impactor. Basically think of an object that hits something, but instead of falling apart or being destroyed, it sort of grazes the surface and then assumes the orbit around the other object. But also implying that this impact very likely created additional satellites that are probably still orbiting there as well, kind of similar to what Pluto has as well. It has all of these additional moons in its orbit. But then on top of this they also looked at other dwarf planets and of course other moons. And overall made very similar discoveries there as well. And this essentially implies that this seems to be some kind of a universal phenomenon that's responsible for creating these very large moons on the outskirts of the solar system. It usually involves a somewhat, I guess, weak impact and potentially some kind of a grazing impact that instead of destroying both objects and mixing them into one, produces some kind of a leftover, extremely similar to how we believe the moon was formed from the collision of planet Earth and Theia. And that's actually why this is an exciting discovery. It implies this might be extremely common, or at least common for the outskirts of the solar system, but may also be common obviously elsewhere, in other star systems. And if it's common in other star systems, there might be other planets, similar to Earth, that have very massive moons that play an important role in stabilizing the planet and basically making it habitable over time. Although obviously there are still some mysteries about all of this as well. For example, when it comes to Haumea, one of the stranger dwarf planets out there, it is a little bit difficult to explain how everything formed here, including its two moons, its unusual rings and its unusual flattened shape. It's also unclear why almost all of these objects have moons. I mean, this seems to be super super common and way way more common than for actual planets. So there's definitely some kind of a mystery here that we currently cannot answer. Here as you can see, out of these 10 objects, 8 have moons. But two other ones are just a little bit dark or a little bit too far away to confirm moons. They might have them too. So yeah, we have a new mystery of dwarf planet moons. Dwarf moons, I guess. But speaking of mysteries, at least one mystery of these unusual objects and their moons has been solved. The biggest dwarf moon out there, Charon, the moon of Pluto. Here the scientists finally solved the reason why it has these unusual scratches, or basically these unusual long depressions, going all the way around the moon. They literally seem to be stretch marks. And specifically stretch marks from something underneath. Once again, a liquid ocean. But the ocean that no longer exists because it completely froze. And so here the scientists were able to explain how the freezing of a relatively large underground ocean would slightly expand this object, forming large stress marks on its surface, because as you know, water expands as it freezes. And this is of course really exciting because it tells us that there was an ocean here, and then it tells us what happens when these oceans freeze, and how they affect the surface at the end. 
Now, there's still maybe some liquid water left here and there because there also seem to be signs of various cryovolcanoes, but for the most part, it seems to have been frozen for a long time. But maybe not Pluto, because here there was another interesting discovery. Here, by analyzing surface features and looking at a crater known as Kiladze Crater, scientists realized it might actually be a sign of an ancient supervolcano. A volcano that erupted millions of years ago and seems to be still kind of active. But unlike your typical Earth volcano, it was not producing lava, it was producing water. Or more technically, liquid cryolava. Basically a mixture of water and potentially things like ammonia that keep water slushy or almost liquid at super low temperatures and pressures. And signs of all of this was discovered around the crater. Signs of recent ammonia and signs of recent liquid water. And so it's most likely an ancient volcano. And obviously the signs of this water indicate that there might still be some kind of an ocean underneath or at least partial ocean, as it's also believed that most of the ocean has already frozen as well. But if something like this was discovered on Pluto, because Eris seems to be more active, we can only imagine that its surface is going to be even more extreme. So yeah, NASA, can we go to Eris please? Thank you. Anyway, for now at least, these are some of the major discoveries from all of the dwarf planets known to us, and discoveries made in the last few months. We'll come back and talk more about this in some of the future videos. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.